I've got three of these, and that can only mean one thing, clusters. So today we're not even talking about my cluster, we're talking about all the problems I had getting these USB 3 2.5 gigabit ethernet adapters to work on Linux. I did in fact buy a set of three, intending on using these with my super low cost hyperconverged cluster. And I was hoping that I could get a performance improvement out of Ceph by moving up to two and a half gig ethernet. And what did I find? Well, these things, when you plug them in, they just don't work right. So today I'm gonna to go into all the troubleshooting I did, the really simple fix and how to get these things to work under Debian-based Linux distributions. So how can we tell we have this problem? So currently ENX is disabled. So let's add it to a bond like I did in the past episode. So I added it to a bond. So now ENP4S0 my gigabit is the backup and ENX, which is my USB ethernet, which should be two and a half gig full duplex is the primary. So let's go in and see what's actually happening. Yeah, so here's the information from the bond. So it shows slave interface is up, but it's half duplex. And if we do an iperf test, it's not gonna be good. So iperf3, client. So I have a server on my network that should be accessible at 10 gigs, except we have a 2.5 gig ethernet interface here. So we're expecting good things. And we get, not awful, 1.4 gigs. How about the reverse? Ooh, that's, that's pretty bad. Um, how about bidirectional? Yeah, so 50 megabits in one direction and 1.4 gigabits in the other. So clearly we're getting better than gigabit, but it's not great. And a lot of people would probably just blame this on poor Realtek hardware, which is what I did initially, but then I started looking at it more, and there's other things that you can't do. So for example, if I want to set the MTU, so IP link set ENX blah blah, MTU 9000. MTU greater than device max. And even if I go just a little bit bigger, like 1550, it's still greater. So I can't use jumbo frames, and I can't even use baby jumbo frames, which are really helpful if you're trying to run VXLAN in your cluster. So what is the root of this problem? So if we run D message, D message grep, ENX. This will show us all the kernel logs related to the device ENX. So it's part of the bond. The bond is aware of it. But it's part of the CDC NCM driver. And this is the generic USB Ethernet driver. So it's not running the correct Realtek driver. And what's funny about this is the correct Realtek driver is in the kernel. It just is not loading it correctly. So if we go to the files that Realtek actually published, which people have been kind enough to mirror on GitHub, um, there's the file here, 8152C, which is in the Linux kernel. But then there's another file here, 50USBRealtekNet.rules. And this is basically a set of UDEV rules telling it what driver to load when it encounters a USB device. So if we just copy this whole thing and paste it into UDEV and reboot, in theory, it should load the correct driver. So nano, let's see, udev, rules.d, 50, usb realtech net.rules. 50 usb realtech net.rules. And then we paste and save. So let's reboot and see what happens to the message when we come back up. Okay, so system came back up. Let's look at the bond again. So now we got full duplex. So if we run dmessage again and grep for the ENX interface, what do we find? There, loaded a different driver this time. It loaded the driver R8152. So the reason that it's the 8152 driver, even though this is the 8156 chipset, is because the 8152 is USB gigabit, and Realtek decided to add 2.5 gig support to their existing gigabit driver named 8152. So just by adding that UDEV rules file, which was part of the release from Realtek, we got it to load the driver that's already in the kernel. We didn't have to compile anything. I tested this on Linux 5.15, 5.19, and 6.1, so all is good. So because I don't have enough two and a half gig switch ports to test this, I decided to directly connect PVE2 and PVE3 with a loopback cable. So we're just gonna be able to ping and send data between them, but not through the global network. So I gave each node its own address, 
FT69 Beef Cafe 3 and FT69 Beef Cafe 2. So I should be able to ping them. So I am on PVE 2, so I'm going to ping PVE 3. And what do you know? Ping. So that means we're at least sending traffic across the interfaces. It works. So what if I set up a server here on PVE 2? iperf3 server. And I go over here to PVE 3 and we run iperf again. Okay, 1.94 gigabits per second. That is pretty darn good. I wasn't expecting a whole lot more out of these uh, Realtek chips. What if we run bi-directional? That was a big pain point before. Okay, so we're getting greater than a gigabit in both directions simultaneously. It looks like we're averaging about one and a half ish with slightly less on the receive side. Yeah, so 1.6 and 1.25. That's better than gigabit, and that's symmetrical, roughly. So we're not complaining about that either. So what about jumbo frames? I hate how this has a gigantic name, but it's the MAC address. ENX and the MAC address. So IP link set giant name, MQ. So can we do baby jumbo frames? Oh yeah. How about big jumbo frames? Oh yeah. I actually tried setting this as high as 12,000, which is outrageously big, but uh, it lets you set it. So can we ping across it now with gigantic jumbo frames? Flip over here and set the high MTU here. When you're working with high MTUs, be very careful. It's easy to get things to stop communicating with each other. I would not recommend this except on very private links. So what if I ping back to PVE2 now? B69, Beef Cafe 2. It still works. How about we add 1,000 bytes? How about we add 2,000 bytes? Oh yeah, it's working. Let's go bigger. How about 9,000 bytes? There are 9,008 bytes. So jumbo frames do work. One thing I did notice with jumbo frames I run iperf again. So FD69 beef cafe 2. I did not get higher bandwidth with iperf with high MTU. So there's something else in the system that's limiting bandwidth, and I suspect it's USB 3. Now there's still reasons to run high MTU in some environments, especially if you're dealing with encapsulation. Sometimes the high MTU can help you get around the encapsulation overhead. So if you're doing a tunnel, for example, that has a 50 MTU byte overhead, you can add 50 bytes to your MTU to use baby jumbo frames to get the encapsulated network back down to 1500. But other than that, it's, it's not really recommended to be used, but it does support them just fine in these real techniques. So in this case, with a 12,000 byte MTU, our, uh, our bit rate was actually a lot closer to symmetrical, which is cool. Still about the same one and a half gigabits per second. So hopefully this little tip here helped you guys. These are in all kinds of different devices. I'll have a link down below to the exact one that I use. It's made by Sabrent, but they're all over. Almost all of them have this real tech chip. Um, the driver is in the kernel, but it just doesn't seem to be fully configured by distros. I'm not sure why. So if you're using Proxmox and this helped you, let me know. Like, thumbs up, all that good stuff. Um, if you want to chat with me more about anything, I have a Discord server, link down below to that too. And uh, as always, I'll see you guys on the next adventure.